podcast from Crew on a Mic is, I think it's really cool and um, that is what I wanted to say. Two and a mic. Two. Today's episode is about Robert Walpole. This is the first in the series of British Prime Ministers, which is running concurrently with the series about US Presidents. In the same way that we have gone into the work of George Washington and John Adams, Presidents 1 and 2, here we go into PM number 1. We are not listing his life's work, his achievements, nor his legacy. We look at what he did. We surmise what kind of person he may have been. We make assumptions based on our research, and we make judgment calls based not only on what his actions were, but also on how since his time, a lot of material has tried to gloss over some of these facts. I won't say much here in the introduction, as today's episode is quite lengthy. Editing the show after Aidan has been on is so entertaining for me, Whenever I have read about history, it has been more or less with a very serious voice in my mind. Aidan throws that rule out of the window. I love how Aidan refers to Robert Walpole as this dude. At one point, he comments on the House of Commons as being wigged up. That's basically where we are, and I love it. Robert Walpole, you have been Aidanized. Welcome to the club. Robert Walpole, Prime Minister and Slaver. Aidan, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm getting used to it, but I have to say, I still appreciate every opportunity that we can chat. So thank you very much for coming back for the, I don't know, umpteenth time. It's wonderful. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. How about you, man? Good, 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 good. We've, um, you know, it's, I tell you, it's almost prophetic, isn't it? Because as soon as we sort of make plans to start talking about British prime ministers, boom, there goes another one. There goes another one. Where, yeah. Liz Truss just this morning was like, all right, I'm resigning. And that's yeah. one of those situations where you're just like, okay, yeah, I'm kind of glad that we made this switch to talk about prime ministers because it's just <laughs> so like fitting. And I mean, she's only, I think what I saw was that she's only been in office for six weeks. And I was just like, wow, that is, that's fast. That's really fast to just be like, all right, I'm done. And like, understandably so, she is, she's done some rough stuff in that really short amount of time. I'm looking forward to our coverage on her in the future. That'll be a fun little tidbit. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, if that if she probably won't constitute the longest episode um mm -hmm. that that we prepare um or produce even but um I, I have a feeling it's going to be quite entertaining but anyway that's that's to come in uh two or three years time so um <laughs> you know we don't want to jump ahead to it because because it's not just the fact that there are 70 odd prime ministers that we have to go through it's also because we're going to sort of um alternate between prime minister and president and so yeah. you know just to, just to keep things um yeah so to speak in in order um yeah i th i bet by the time that we're like up to more modern time that we're gonna have a new president and i mean obviously we're gonna have a new prime minister at this point but <laughs> i mean like <laughs> it's just one of those things where it's just like dang dude this is this is a big project and i'm really excited to like go through all of it because there already there's been so many things that i've just been like wait i didn't know about that what the heck like why don't i know about this stuff man i just don't get it <laughs> i don't get it i'm with you yeah because i you know i always i okay i like to think that i'm you know pretty well read with regards to certain uh, periods in history but i have to say that my um the, the sort of last three four hundred years um you know I've, I've done a bit more sort of old sort of ancient history as it were 
uh, but then also 20th century history. But, you know, the the p time period that we've been looking at, so sort of you know, uh, late 18th century and and, and then now we're going to, um, yeah, no, actually still 18th century. Yeah, um, we are 18th century, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, th these are time periods which I know very, very little about. And, you know, I know a few names here and there and blah, blah, blah. But, I, you know, so this is a lot of this is like really cool yeah. research and discovering stuff. And it's, uh, um, yeah. But a question just occurred to me. Of all the presidents, which are you looking forward to doing a show on the most? Reagan. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that bad boy. I fucking hate Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just excited. Yeah, him and Nixon. I'm also excited to get into uh, Bush and, and Barack Obama as well, just because, like, some of these more recent presidents, like, I mean, even the Democratic presidents, like we've talked about before, are not all that great. Um, like, we were going to talk about the Clintons, to talk about bad Dems, and then we were like, you know what, let's just go through all of them. Because it's kind of difficult to, to do that lineup from, from nothing. And so, like, I mean, I'm excited to get into Barack Obama just because he has done a lot of pretty not awesome things, like... I mean, I feel like on my side of the Internet, what, what I see a lot is that, yeah, Barack Obama is a war criminal. He is he is a terrorist. Like and I'm 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 pretty much in that boat, too. Like homie is doing all them drone strikes. Ooh, that's pretty not chill. Quite a, and, yeah, I think more bombs dropped than during the entire Vietnam War. I think something like that. That's quite a statistic, isn't it? Yeah. For, the, for a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. Which right. Is also, you know, and like during a time where like America's like not really at war but still kind of at war in the middle east like it's not like a full-fledged mm. war but it's still like a conflict that's going on and to be dropping that much like munitions on the ground and to be killing so many civilians as well is just one of those things where i'm just like yep i can't i cannot appreciate you for what you have done sir that is too messed up like if people were doing that in America or to America, you know that we would be fighting that shit right back. We'd be like, uh, oops, so oops. so excited, that, I punched my mic. <laughs> you, you, that, that was actually our um, sound uh, department <laughs> introducing a bomb noise. Yeah, uh, bomb yes. noise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to just quickly, I have to say that I'm really looking forward to covering Kennedy, yeah, because um, Ken, Kennedy's, um, you know, obviously his uh, his assassination story will form a big part of my sort of preparation for that. We, I mean, to be honest, we could go on for like years and years and years about that stuff. But I mean, you know, all good things come to those who yeah. wait. And so Fair. we are going to have to do that, too. Oh, <sighs> I can't hold you. it in. Oh, man. It's oh, tough. Man. So. So today you've jumped across the pond and yeah. you have joined me here and uh, well, I'm not here in London anymore. I'm in Berlin, but on this side, at least of the Atlantic, yeah. there you go. Um, and we are jumping back to, yeah, the reason why I was a bit com almost confused myself is because Walpole was born in the 17th century, so 1676. Um, and this is the person who became known as the first prime minister of the United Kingdom. Um, wow, man. After yeah, seeing, Aiden, like, uh, how, how long he was alive. <laughs> wow. I didn't I don't think I realized how long that dude was kicking. Holy shit. That's a long time in that time period. He didn't die until yeah. 1745. That's like almost he 59, almost 60 years old. He went some. I mean, Da Vinci lived longer, but Da Vinci was an was an artist. And, and, yeah, uh, and not so. a fucking corrupt, crazy <laughs> lunatic man, well, as far as well, I'm aware of. <laughs> you, you never know. Yeah, yeah. as in uh, those guys did all sorts of stuff over during the Renaissance. But um, Truth. yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, we um, Walpole was prime minister, the longest reigning prime minister, twenty one years. Um, he did a lot of shit. Mm. <laughs> Not a lot of good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, was, I mean, yeah. From what I could tell, like, so many of the things, like, man, yeah, just, dude, 
it, it feels like there are so many of these moments of just like dudes who get lucky and they get like the right what I would call spawn point and there they are and this guy is just one of those cases where he and like he just gets lucky like I yeah just I mean he had a rich dad if I'm not mistaken and like mm-hmm. he inherited um like his father's seat at at the court and so like that's an automatic in. I don't think too many people get that kind of luxury of my daddy is in court, and since he died, I get to be new court daddy. Like, that doesn't happen too often. Like, that's fucking lucky as hell, man. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th- this is one of the things about the sort of, sort of landed gentry, the aristocracy. You know, this is why later on, you know, I think we've also talked about this, but with regards to uh, liberals and neoliberalism, um, you know, these families really weren't happy about relinquishing power. They did not want women to vote. They did not want people who uh, had no property of their own to vote. They did not want to share the power of election with anyone. Um, uh, but you know, obviously, eventually, they were forced to do so. Um, but let's Ew. just go through. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, Sorry, I'm an American, but no, 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 we don't cool, believe but... in voter rights. <laughs> <laughs> we do, but if you vote for us. Yeah, yeah but only yeah. if you vote for the right side. Mm, yeah, God. unfortunately. But Sorry. This... <laughs> no, no, that's cool. That's cool. That's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in, in sort of stuck between a stone and a hard place here because I, on the one hand, I'd like to get through as much as um, about Walpole as possible. But on the other hand, um, I also want to maintain what we've managed to create with the, the first two that we've done with regards to presidents is you know, drawing um, some relevance between those historical characters and the world that we inhabit today. Because yeah. um, uh, I think it's important to try to remember that, you know, so what some of these people did then it's still connected to us today. And a big part of that story is, if I can quickly introduce, so Walpole was a Whig. Um, yeah. And uh, the Whigs don't exist anymore. Some people have uh, suggested that they are perhaps most similar to the traditional liberals, um, the elitist liberals. Um, but I'm not sure that necessarily carries. But yeah. funnily enough, Whig is actually old Scottish Gaelic for horse thief. Um so, so that's an interesting um, that, thing to remember. Yeah. That's weird. Hmm. Another thing is, so the other party at the time, which was quite predominant, was the Tories. We still have the Tories now, actually. And apparently a Tory is uh, Irish, uh, some Irish term, meaning papist outlaw. Um, and so yeah, I have. No matter what, what party you're in. You're a bad guy. Oh, yeah. Is what absolutely. I'm hearing. That's awesome. I fucking love that. If that's how it was in America, if like, I don't know what Democrat or Republican mean other than bad guy. <laughs> but, I'm, but I mean, there, there must be some terms that they used for each other, too. Yeah. I'm sure. I mean, maybe we'll discover it in uh, as we sort of develop, because where, where we've come in or where we've reached after John Adams, it's just now the creation of the two party system or it's about yeah. to be the creation of a two party system. So we're yeah. still perhaps to, to develop that, aren't we? And even with John Adams, we're seeing the dissolving of one of said parties, like immediately, like the Federalists during said time are like, I mean, George Washington was a Federalist and then moving forward, like past John Adams, he is the death of the Federalist Party. And it is just anti-Federalists after him with like Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison. So, I mean, very similar situation here of like, I mean, I didn't know that the Tories are still around. That's amazing. Um, learning about the Tories, I loved seeing like what the Tories were doing to oppose Wal- uh, Warpole. Like later on, I was just like, understandable because fuck this guy, man. Like, God, there were so many times when he was just doing things and I was just like, you can just do that. Like you oppose somebody. So now you're kicking them out of their office. What? Like. That's insane. Yeah, we'll get into that stuff later because that stuff I was the whole time I'm just sitting here and I'm just like, what? That's so that's unbelievable. That's so much power. 
Yeah, and and the thing is as well, when people um, voted representatives from their various constituencies, they did it. There wasn't this strict party adherence that they had. So whoever was there um, in in the area was had sort of put themselves forward. Um, if they had the, the ability to get the most influential people within that region uh, to essentially say, yeah, I'll choose that guy. That's the one who was elected. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not like we had these like huge all the people coming together to vote. That didn't happen. You know, yeah. mass voting did not exist in those days. These are rotten boroughs. These are people who I I've got some cash. Yeah. Come and tell me why I should get my friends to vote for you. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to give me? Um, Damn. And that's basically the way yeah. things were done. Yeah. And what did like. I mean, and seeing how Warpole like set himself up to have all these allies in all of his courtings, like, I mean, him making such good friends with um, the Princess of Wales, I think it was, like, that that he he only did that to maintain his position when the succession of uh, King George the Second happened, like. It's all this dude had it all planned out like he was 10 steps ahead most of the time to make sure that wherever he was at, he was still going to have power. Like and even when he died, I thought it was crazy that he like got his protege to to get into like the master position of, of some sort. Like it, it was a, a big position. And I was just like, of course you fucking did. Like a, a, like in a similar way of like what John Adams did with like. He was so political that, like, it was his only focus, you know? It was the only thing that he thought about, and eventually it it made him fodder out. But, like, making that protege, like, his son for John Adams, like, he made his son to be president, which is why, of course, we have another John Adams as a president later on. Like, mm. and so it's fun to see these weird connections of, like, yeah, no, it's the same shit overseas, too. Like, it's not any different where we're at in America, like— we're doing the exact same shit. It's still the same people who are voting. It's the same groups of people who are participating in these elect elections. Like, it's such a crazy thing to. I just love drawing in those all those comparisons. You know, like it's the same shit. Well, as we said last time, talking about John Adams, you know, he was very close to the British. You know, Jefferson yeah. was very much associated with the French, but Adams really liked the way that the British went about things. And, you know, when he introduced the, the laws that he did towards the end to almost create a kind of you know, aristocratic, monarchic, uh, you know, ability for himself. Yeah. You know, these are things which are very similar to what's happening at the time in, in, in the UK. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. So just quickly, a bit more sort of background then um walpole is one of 19 kids so jesus christ yeah, there's there's quite a lot going on there um imagine living who, in that household yeah it's I, I, as you said that they're quite rich yeah and the house yeah quite... <laughs> you probably got like you probably never fucking see one another <laughs> although i'm sure if they didn't fuck, want dude. to they didn't have to yeah, like, mm. I'm sure that they're, like, wandering off into the middle of nowhere, and then, like, they're bumping into each other occasionally, but fuck, dude, that's 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 21 people in a home, not including your servants, which I'm sure that they had plenty of servants, you know, like, that's a lot of people, holy cow, man, mm. I can't imagine the bills, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're probably well, rolling I mean, in it. Yeah, and, um, yeah, they're rolling in a lot of things, actually, but we'll come back to that <laughs> as well, but, um, yeah, so he he went to Eton in 1690, but when his older his last remaining uh, elder brother died in 1698, he went back to help his dad run the family estate. But then his dad died a couple of years later, and that left him with a bucket load of uh, problems because he basically had no income of his own, as it were, yeah. necessarily. Um, there was the, the management of the estates, which was quite a cost. Um, and, and so therefore this, he basically had to make a decision. What do I do? Um, and so the best way and the quickest way to make money in those days, if you had influence was to get involved in politics. And so basically that's what he did. Yeah. yeah. So he, in 1701, he, he won the, um, election at Castle Rising. Uh, but then the year later, he went to King's Lynn 
because it was a far more important borough. And isn't that where he represented for like the next 40 years? Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. My God. That's insane. It is. It is. Even when he was in trouble, they kept on um, yeah. re- re-electing him. Yeah, and that that was the thing that I thought was so funny. Is like pretty early on in his career, he gets in trouble and then he uh, just keeps going. Like he he's removed from his position, isn't he? Like, I mean, I I'm I'm pretty sure that he is. Like during yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, Spanish yeah. War, he gets introduced as um like he's made um a member of Prince George's Denmark's council, which controlled the affairs during the conflict. And then three years per- later, he was promoted to secretary secretary at war um, in 1710. And then two years later, he was made treasurer of the Navy. Um, and then he would be d- dismissed from that position in the following year with the Tory party when they took power. Um, and yeah, that's when he got in trouble. Yeah. yeah, he was thrown in prison, and yeah. uh, he he spent. He was taken to the months. Tower of London, right? He was in the Tower of London for yeah. six months. The lucky bastard. Yeah, um, I was like, man. <laughs> yeah, it's really expensive now to visit the Tower of London. Actually, I think it's like twenty pound per ticket. So, um, yeah, he. Dang. Yeah, it is crazy expensive. He got a, a free ticket. Building. Yeah, and meals as well. Yeah, shit. Um, that's it. It's crazy. It is absolutely My crazy, God. but. The the thing is, it's quite, again, another sort of parallel is that the amount of governments which basically collapsed at at the time, um, um, uh, it's quite similar to what's happening at the moment in in the UK. But, um, yeah, that's uh, that's the situation that uh, that they had then. So they had all of these warring factions and they basically were all fighting for power, for supremacy. Now, there's no issue about going to uh, the people and selling yourselves like campaigning in the way that we see today. The only thing they needed to make sure was the influential elements of society. They were the ones that they had to take care of. If they could make sure they had enough people to come back and be elected into parliament, then they basically controlled all of the um, the strings of power. And as you say, Walpole was brilliant at planning and making sure that he had enough people in there to take care of himself and he had balls didn't he if if i'm like i hate to say it but i i do find that oddly admirable like in terms of (laughs) like this dude knew who to hold in his pocket for the right times i don't know if it's actually admirable of but more of just like something that i'm like I respect that in like a, that in a really fucked up way. Like you are planning that shit out 10 moves ahead of everyone else at this time. Like there's nothing about that that to me is not kind of impressive. Like you're doing it in all the wrong ways. But the fact that you can c- continue to maintain that position. And I mean he was there for 40 freaking years, man. Like – in that case, you have to be 10 steps ahead of everybody else. And especially with, like, such an opposing force like the Tories were at the time, like, he made sure that there weren't Tories in power. Like, he w- consistently, he was kicking them out whenever they opposed him openly. And he was like, get the fuck out of here. This is bullshit. I'm a wig guy. And so, like, he had the courts were wigged up. He had um, – fuck – there was something else that he had wigged up, but it was, but he couldn't get, he could never get the House of Commons wig to be wigs, and so like he just implemented weird policies to kind of try to keep the House of Commons like settled for him, and so like it makes sense that this dude had this power for so long because he knew who to hold in his pocket, he knew how to appease, he was really fucking good at arguing. Like that was the biggest thing that I kept saying was just how fucking good this dude was at just being a fantastic arguer like every single time he was given an opportunity to he was like this is what it is and like it often got people to see it that way and that's impressive so Mm. yeah what a wild guy (laughs) i i came across a bit of an inconsistency with regards to the the dates um in in the research because it, it um at many points they kind of and lots of different sources talk about how um intelligent 
a business person he was and that mm. he made some very um, early investments uh, at a young age in the South Sea Company. Now, the problem oh God, that I, I can't. Have, oh, my God. <laughs> the problem that I have with this is that the South Sea Company was established in 1711. So he wasn't that young. Um, right. To have, you know, had these all this amazing business acumen. So he was 35 by then. Um, but it has to be pointed out because a lot of people, you know, depending on where you read the information, they they really brush over this South Sea Company thing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't they? Don't did they? you notice? Did you yeah. notice that? Yeah. 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 I fucking did. It was so <laughs> stupid. I was like, you're not even gonna mention the fact that this is a slave company, dog. Like the name, the main title of them was labeled as a fishery thing, and then like under that, it was like also they did some stuff for slaves. Like they traveled slaves to the West Indies, and I was like, you're gonna tack that on as like a little extra. Fuck you, man. And that was when, like, everything for me for Walpole just went downhill. I was just like, fuck you, man. You took advantage of this situation. Like, I mean, he set up a scheme while he was in office to, like, he and a bunch of other Whigs set up this scheme. Is it okay if I talk about this? Please, since, please, since we're please. bringing it up? Because I, as please. soon as I, oh, my gosh, that got me so, like, riled up. So they set up this fucking scheme that, like, I guess the South Sea Company is going to take on part of the national debt for uh, Britain. And Walpole is like, yeah, no, that's a fucking great idea. Love that. And he is like during this time, he and all these wigs are sending like they're fucking investing in the company. Like they're going to make buku bucks off of this investment because they're like, yeah, no, this is going to go great. And then it all fucking collapses like. And Warpole is the one of the only dudes who gets out of it pretty much unscathed because his fucking banker is really good at his job and is like, yo, that's actually a bad idea, though. <laughs> and so then he fucking gets out of there. And during the time, all these fucking wigs are like losing office. They're being criticized in the streets because of all the things that they've done. And so Walpole takes it on to himself to fucking defend these people. And he does. He defends them and he keeps them in power. He keeps them in office. He keeps so many of these people in positions of power. And then like, I mean, it was said that he did have to make public sacrifices for like some things. Like there were people who did have to like be stepped down from office i mean his son died during this time as well like i i thought that it was weird that his son was labeled as one of the sacrifices during the time i don't under like I, okay um because it just passed right over that like it was just like his son was one of the sacrifices of the time and it was just his first name and then it was like and back to blah 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 and i was just like if it was that significant then i feel like we would have talked about that more we would have heard more about like how impactful that was on you but like i didn't see anything about how impactful that was i didn't see anything about that like but just the fact that he did that and he was able to keep all these wigs from like the public criticism that was happening he was able to turn it all around in the way that he did is just like fuck you man fuck you yeah, we, we have to um, recognize the fact that the first prime minister of the UK was a slaver. Yes. Yeah, as in, you know, let's say it loud and clear. It's not like he didn't know what was happening. Um, you know, he'd invested in this company for many, many years. They knew exactly yeah. what was going on. Um, the absolute raw, inhumane corruption of what was going on. Um a lot of the cabinet did actually um, face charges. They were found guilty of corruption because of the uh, South Sea bubble uh, bursting. Yeah. But he intervened, as you say, and saved Stanhope and Sunderland, who up until then um, had been um, yeah, problematic, shall we say. Yeah. Um, at least one of them. Um, and and the, the thing is, his banker... When you say he rescued him, basically gave him the advice, look, this is this is bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's insider 
trading. No yeah. kidding. <laughs> well, the whole thing is insider trading, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. They know what's going on. They know that the that the national treasury is going to get taken over by this fucking company. And so they're like, yeah, no, this is a great idea. And so they're taking part in insider trading. Like it's the same thing that we saw with COVID-19 with like, I mean, in the US, we saw politicians you do too. insider trading. Like, and I mean, like, yeah, like you said, there too. I mean, everybody who was in a position of power during the time saw what was happening and they took advantage of it. And there are no repercussions for these people. Like, and we're seeing why. It's because it's never, there have never been repercussions for these people. I mean, we saw small repercussions for some of them, but like they've maintained power and historically they continue to get away with it. And that's why they will continue to get away with it is like, because we've never done anything differently, you know? It's just one of these things where it's like, yeah, I hated that they glossed over the slavery thing. I hate that they didn't really talk about how that was insider trading that much. Like, there are so many things about how it was, like, they glossed over these things that I was just like, this is fucking fucked, man. Like, no wonder there aren't any, like, big documentaries out there on YouTube about this guy because... Like, I mean, I couldn't find any on YouTube that were like out an hour long. Like, I'm looking for those good, hearty, fucking length documentaries, and I couldn't find a single one on YouTube. Like, I did all my research, like, just re reading, writing, like everything. But even then, it was still like, it felt scarce. And like, I had to do the extra clicking to get into the extra things to figure out that, oh, so we are glossing over that this is a slave trading company. We are glossing over that this is insider trading. We are glossing over the fact that this dude is committing treason. Like, there are so many elements going on here that I'm just like, we're fine with this? We're fine with this, man. Why? And we're still fine with it. It's still happening. We still see all this shit happen to this day. There's no – it feels like the only difference is that like there's difference in voting, like who who can be voting for these people. But even then, it's like does it make a difference? It doesn't fucking feel like it. Like it's just so frustrating. It's so frustrating to see the lack of change, you know? Mm. And another thing to point out with regards to the South Sea Company <clears throat> is is that when it went down, because obviously the bubble burst, yeah. its stock was divided between two entities. One was the Bank of England, and the other one established the East India Company. Oh my God! So these these are damn. The these are the Damn. bastards. Yeah. As in, this is the kind of thing which happens. So, you know, we've seen a company, it goes down. Yeah. It's, it's a slaving organization. They've made money on the back of the, the, the torture, the terrorization of innocence. Yeah. Um, but it only goes down because it became a bad investment for these rich people in, in Europe. And then after that, what happens? You know, it doesn't just go down. That thing's got stuck. You know, well, there's a value in it. Yeah, and now it's got to be turned into something else. And if you just change the name of it, it's a different thing, obviously. Duh. Yeah. Yeah, and then like – also... Yeah, go on. Sorry. But but like the East India Trading Company is still doing so much of the same stuff. Like, and they're – and what I would even say, doing things worse. Like the East India Trading Company is – I feel like we could do an entire episode about them, <laughs> like just because they are such like, wow, what a force of power that they were, like the things that they were doing to people in the places that they were at, like, wowza, man. And the way that they tr just treated individuals as a whole is just like, oh, my God, what a fucking horrible situation. Like, yeah, that would be that would be a fun episode. I would love to do an episode just talking about <laughs> them. Jesus Christ. Fuck. Yeah, I mean, these guys represented the foreign interests of of the of the of the, well, of the country of the yeah. UK in, in India, at least um, and that area for many, many years. And it was only when some of the news started to come back to the UK of the barbarity of their policies um, and the the failures, the repeated failures. Um, of the East India Company that um, that the government took, well, actually had to send in proper soldiers. And even yeah. then, um, they continued to fail miserably. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But um, yeah, I mean, the direct participation of the Bank of England. I mean, the thing is, nowadays, people look at because especially now, right, Liz Truss and Kwarteng, when they produced their mini budget and completely screwed up the, the British economy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bank of England came in to rescue the, the British economy. So yeah. um, the Bank of England at the moment is looked at in this way that, oh, what would we do without them? These people are the saviors of the British economy and so on. Um, you know, have a look at the history of the Bank of England. Have a look at some of the dodgy people um, that have been, uh, you know, the chairman of the Bank of England. Um it's ridiculous. And, you know, as you say, maybe we will get around to doing an episode on the East India Company. We may also end up doing an episode on central banks, because I yeah. would love to talk about the relationship between the Bank of England and the Fed. <laughs> those dirty bastards. Are yeah, also... no kidding. I fucking hate both of them. <laughs> God, every time that we get into like one of these conversations, I just end up finding like another thing that I'm like, yeah, no, I do fucking hate that thing too. Gosh, I, I, I think I might just hate everything. Apparently, like, I just sound like such a pessimist, but like, I there are things that I really do care about in this world, but like, so many of these th these things are just painful to talk about because it's just like, there's no change, there's no like. I mean, we've done so many things in, in the name of, like, progress and in the name of advancement and, like, the sacrifices that we have gone through as, like, people and to see that we're still struggling and that we're still in such a similar spot. Like, I mean, especially living in America and right now, like, it feels like we're just keep going backwards, you know, like, and I mean, it's fucking terrifying to just watch it continue to go backwards and backwards and backwards like i mean seeing all the possibility of like like i mean i've been seeing uh people who are running for candidacy in southern states that are like openly being like yeah we oppose interracial marriage and gay marriage and it's like dude this is 2022 man like what the fuck is going on like I thought that I thought we have been done with this. I like and I, not even that long ago that I thought that we've been done with this, but I thought that this was over and it's obviously fucking not. And that's so fucking horrible. Like how how is this happening? How is this happening? So anyway, back to <laughs> God. Warpole no, I mean, just being like mm. Yeah. So Walpole, basically, what he does, again, as you said before, um, he's sort of 10 steps ahead. So he's when the king and his son have a bit of an argument um, after the first Jacobite War in, in 1715. So thereafter, the, the king and the Prince of Wales have a bit of an argument. Um, yeah. Walpole has an opportunity and him and a few for a few of his friends go and spend time with the Prince of Wales. And then eventually Walpole brings the prince back more or less come on let's just go and see your dad and uh you know let's get back to it so basically that they, they become quite friendly so he's yeah. now friends not only with the prince of wales but also with the king um in 1719 um there is a peerage bill introduced i think it's by the tories and he's against this because the peerage bill wants to limit the power of the crown to provide peerages and he knows that he can use that power for his own benefit walpole knew that if he could get his people yeah peered up as it were by the king then then he'd be hey, fine yeah and also because you know if you want a peerage who do you go to i mean they don't have access to the king yeah but maybe they'll have access if they've got enough money to Mr. Walpole over here. God damn. And then therefore, you know, mm. it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like the Pope, isn't it? More or less, you, you know, the person <laughs> who has access to, you know, the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Um, is basically the one who holds all the power. God, that's insane. My God. Like I said, knew who to hold in his pocket, knew how to take advantage of it as well. You know, like that's insane. To, and I mean, like, and that is what really did help him stay and the Whigs stay in power for the next, like, 20 years, isn't it? Like, 
Very yeah. much so. Very <laughs> like, much so. Yeah. You could even say the next 50 years, more or less. Um, so as in, you know, this is what he eventually uh, managed to achieve um, because of the, the, the huge amount of influence that he exerted. So even though he himself didn't hang around for that long, that's because he'd pissed off so many people um, that they just had to get rid of him. But they carried yeah. on that their influence and um yeah it wasn't until much later that the tories made a comeback yeah man that's crazy like yeah that's all i got for that it's just <laughs> i mean yeah. just fucking <clears throat> i don't know i'd li- like good job also fuck you is kind of how i feel about it like <laughs> that's impressive also stop <laughs> you know like that's such a abuse of power you know like to be able to do that it feels like a secured ability to be like, yep, I'm going to stay here. Like, I'm going to continue this. I'm, you're not going to get rid of me kind of thing. And he's already established himself so far with all these high end individuals, you know, like, as we've already mentioned, like he's he's being well established at this point. And I mean, like one of the things that I read was that he was becoming really well established and becoming like quite a socialite. Um, but like. During all this time, he's accumulating a big debt. Like, I'm not sure if he ever gets rid of this debt, um, but he does have a big debt for a while, and that's uh, attracts with a lot of the rich people that I, I can think of. So, yeah, this is this is all warpole energy. <laughs> but this is why he has to stay in power um, because he needs to make sure that he can continue that lifestyle and also yeah. fin- finance that uh, that debt, as it were. Um, and and this is a thing that we have to always remember because nowadays when you ask people, okay, why why did you become a, you know a, a politician? It's, oh, I want to help the people. I want to do this. I want to do that. Blah blah blah. Um, and even in the case of um, Walpole, at one point um, he has a big problem with the king because he feels as though um, the king is only um, conducting those actions which in many ways were in the interest of his German possessions mm. and not, and not the, um, not his, as it were, British responsibilities. Yeah. And so therefore, you know, this is why there was also a split because um, he, that's why he supported the Prince of Wales and not the father. So, you know, theoretically speaking, he's kind of positioning himself within public life as being somebody, I speak for the nation. I have the yeah. nation's interests at heart. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it's all like he is very much telling him everybody that he is very there for the British interest. He, is, I mean, in the past, he has shown that he is for British interest type policy um, and very much standing for it. But you'll see that slip, you know, like he begins to have those slips um, just like any everybody, you know, like and especially in his older age, as he continues to do this, like it begins to shut down like the confidence that people have in him um, because he did gain a rather large following for being who he was and being so like powerful for the party that he was a part of. But eventually, like, I mean, if you're in power for fucking 40 years, dog, eventually there are going to be young people who come up and are like, I don't like you anymore. I don't think I, I think I can do this better than you. And we'll see this happen with Warpole as well. Like the similar track of like young people coming in being like, no, you're stupid. <laughs> and like, I hope, I hope that this tracks, like if, if we're seeing, like, I hope that we'll like history repeats itself and we're seeing more young people come in and do that sort of stuff nowadays. Like, I feel like there's just so many old people in politics who have been in there for like decades, it feels like, and who have been, not even it feels like they have been like, I want more young people to come in there and just be like, no, fuck you, man. Like, get out. It's time for, like, not the same things for 80 years. Like, and it's fun to see that happen with Warpole. I wasn't expecting that to happen, genuinely. I wasn't expecting him to have his party be the party that kind of was like, yeah, no, get out. And that's exactly what happens. 
Yeah, well, he had um, some very, very prominent um, opponents, as yeah. it were. I mean, there were, you know, people like Dr. Samuel Johnson, um, Alexander Pope. You know, I mean, these are people who were in many ways, uh, you know, intellectual giants of the period. Um, and they didn't like Walpole, either because he just was such a polarizing figure. As in one of the ways which he basically, upon which he created his reputation was that he went after anybody who was um, against him and his party. And he yep. was just so critical, constantly critical. And this is something that we see today. Yeah, whether it's Democrats, whether it's Republicans, whether it's Tories, whether it's uh, Labour, whether it's Liberal Democrat, whatever it is. Every politician feels that no matter what happens, they have to strike a party political message, a blow of some sort upon the opposition. And yep. it's there constantly. And we can almost trace that behavior right back to Walpole because he made it work for himself. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's very and we, we both know a lot of people know, I suppose, as well, listening. You know, it's very hard to build, to create something. It's extremely easy to destroy oh and yeah he knew that really well so yeah. you know you build yourself up no problem with one word in the house of commons i will destroy you and that's yep. what he did yeah and it's a, like like you said to be able to track it back to to this you know like i mean we do see all that shit all the time here like in america overseas like it's always the it's always a blow to the other party to like just attack them and it doesn't matter what standpoint you have like yeah we as individuals may have commonalities but because you're on that other side i'm going to attack you um like warpole knew that like you said he knew that very well and he used it often it was something like in order to maintain wig control in the places that he had it he was consistently and often he was kicking out like Tories who opposed him openly, like especially in his later years, as there are more and more people who are opposing him, like he's kicking out more and more people, you know, like we're seeing we see it happen. And it's like him just being like, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm done with you. Like, if you don't like me, you don't like the things that I go for. Get out. And he's just doing it like and that's that's insane like to have that ability to do that and he's already got all these people in his pockets who will support those movements that it's no big deal like it's not even like it's just he just speaks and it happens kind of thing like it's not like a big effort of him you know it's god it's a 10 steps ahead thing he's just he's been he's doing it and he knows what's going to happen and he can just it's it's as simple as just executing like just pushing a button on a keyboard like he's just like doop and it's done like it feels like these are all very precise actions that he's doing you know like he's got it all laid out it's insane dude is playing chess and we're all playing checkers it, the more i read about walpole the more i said to myself Do you know what? i have a feeling george R. R. martin read about this guy because um you, you kind of really get into this oh shit man is he like the original lannister yeah, yeah. In, that, that's the kind of feeling Interesting. i got yeah? okay i might have to like now that i'm thinking about it well like the whole time that i was reading like all the names of like the earls and and everything i was just like man i really want to watch game of thrones like i'm just like <laughs> it's so crazy that like i mean especially in america that's like we don't have kings we don't have earls we don't have dukes we've never had things like that like that's not part of our history so it's not really something that we really dive into about learning about that i can recall and so like just hearing about it as like a real thing sometimes is always just a little bit jarring for some reason i'm just like wow that's a real like these are kind of real things that are happening and that have happened in the world with like people doing these things and being like this. Like that's insane. That is crazy to me. But like I loved hearing about all the way that like it was going on because it did feel very like Game of Thronesy in the feels of like th we're only doing the politics side of it, you know, and all and we're all on the inside with like one of the skeezy characters who's like, I don't really trust what you're doing. 
but the way that you're going about it, I can't help but respect. So yes, very much like a Lannister. Like he he is the Lannister party. Yeah, I think I think you've sold me on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in the in the mid twenties, he's overcome the financial crisis, um, which was created by the 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 bubble. Um, of the the South Sea Company, he's negotiated a peace with the other European powers. The country is making money again, so Walpole gets knighted. Um, on top of that, his son is granted a barony, um, which always, of course, makes you think back to ah, no wonder he fought the peerage bill. So he's yeah. not only sorted himself out. He's <clears throat> excuse me, not only sorted himself out. He's also made sure. Um, that uh, his son uh, becomes a, a hereditary baron. Yeah, he's he's yeah. making sure that his like not just he's set up in in the future because like we will see that this does help him out later on, um, but he's also making sure that like his his family's set up like that his son is set up like the, these are important things to him that he makes sure that these like if anything happens to him that these are these people would be fine i feel like if anything i can respect that and can understand where he's coming from especially because like he did experience that when he was younger like with his dad passing and just being like here's all this shit that you have to deal with but at the same time i don't like the whole hereditary thing i think it's so like just because my dad had this thing now i get to have it like it's like i don't even really like that with like if if my parents died, if I were to inherit our house, I'm not even a huge fan of that. I feel like that's still kind of weird. Like, I wouldn't mind if this house just, like, went on to the open market again. But at the same time, like, I don't know. It's so – I have contr- – like – Don't let Tracy views. hear that. Don't yeah, let I was Tracy. Like, I was like, I was like <laughs> my mom around? Fuck. <laughs> Feeling safe. Mm. So we, we've we got now then – we've got through the 20s. Um, yeah. That he's managed to establish a huge amount of support in the House of Commons. Um, interestingly, at this point, still, the level of sort of military industrialization is not such that there is a group of mysterious people who are saying war, war, war. On the contrary, there is there, you know, the overriding uh, policy is to avoid war. Because yeah. by doing so, you keep taxes low. And what that means is that the, the the rich people don't have to give money to the government to waste on killing people who would normally be back at home, uh, providing them with almost free labor. So yeah. for the rich people, war doesn't make any sense. It's expensive. Yeah. It doesn't provide them with any particular benefit. So um, this is very, very popular um, in, in the UK at the time. Uh, and so therefore his power continues to grow yeah. and like because because like i mean there are people who are rooting for war on the inside and there are people in the council who are voting for war and warpole during this time is doing a really good job of keeping the peace like i feel like that's something that was talked about a lot was that during a lot of these foreign affairs that Warpole was really good at maintaining peace as often as he could and that there was like only one instance near the end of his career where he was forced into a war. Um, And like it's probably it is probably because he knew that it was all like on like it was all at stake, you know, like, I mean, he's already only in this to stay afloat, you know, like he's already in this to make his money. And so this is just a detriment to how much money he can make, you know? So why do that? And he's really good at standing on the points that he believes in and the things that he thinks are true. And so he's going to continue to stay in power be, like because, like you said, there's no benefit to going to war right now. Like there isn't this giant industrialized war machine that we have created to make war profitable like we've seen it in more recent times like war is extremely profitable like oh my god i saw like not to like completely sidestep but like there was this crazy fox news thing that i saw that was them talking about the war in ukraine right now and the fucking like the fox news spokesman was like 
talking about how the Ukrainians only had like these certain missiles. And then he was like, but you know what would really help them out is if they went over to Raytheon.com and bought these like crazy things. And I was just like, dude, are you like a spokesperson for Raytheon? Like you're advertising that shit. You're like selling it. It's such a war machine thing that like people are like, oh, yeah, no. They really do need the Raytheon X-25 missile caliber rifle thing. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, it's there isn't that industrialized war machine of people being like, yeah, no, we need to go to war so that way we can make trillions of dollars off of building weapons, selling them to our enemies, ourselves, people on the in-between. Like, it's crazy to see that there's there's a motivation for peace and it's because there isn't this war machine yet. And that's like, I don't know, it's slightly disheartening because we have created that war machine that makes war so damn profitable. Like, that's why we continue to see so many conflicts to this day is because there is that war machine that really does, like, in the background, behind everything that we don't, we aren't seeing, there are people who are selling guns and making a lot of fucking money and selling them to our allies, selling them like selling them to us, selling them to our enemies. Like we talked about this with the Iranian Contra affair. Like we were selling guns to everybody. Whoever wanted a gun, fuck it. But like this is a time period where that's not a concern. That's not a thing where we've like made these factories to just pop out all these weapons and guns and machines. And like I miss the good old days, kind of. <laughs> well, th- these are still the times of the nations, isn't it? So yeah. therefore, if you're if you're a, a Brit, um, you know, as we said before, Walpole was extremely critical of the king because it seemed as though the king was looking after his German interests. You know, they were against um, in, in the Spanish War succession. They were very much against France because they didn't want France to you know further enhance itself and so on. On the other hand, the French. Um, were very much involved or still involved with uh, the Pope. And so therefore they were seeking, um, you know, I suppose papal support so that they could fight back against the Brits or the English. Um, yeah. You know, so in those times, it's very different. It's only a bit later on with the growth of the, the central banks, uh, the bankers, <clears throat> the industrialists, where they, where this sort of changes, you know, it's no longer about nations. It's it's a question of the business. It's a question, it's a question of, of the money. family, the position. Exactly. Yeah. Like, because just fighting for the English, that's cool, but that but it's means not you only have access to one pot. Exactly. Yeah. You need to develop access to more pots. The more pots, the better, because that's where you become super rich. Yep. And um, we will see how this affects, like in the future. Like like you said, it's it's coming soon like it's not far off like we are going to be seeing like it it really does kick off very close to where the industrial revolution is happening because we are able to mass produce things so fast we are able to like make goods at such an efficient rate and at such little care for actual workers that it's just like pump that money baby and so we get that monetary gain and like you said it's no longer a thing about nations like at this point it really is a nation thing like i mean it's it's what i would call like the equivalent of the space race right now or like in the more recent times of like these countries are all making these moves to the americas to establish themselves to become like the power you know like britain is going out there and they're establishing colonies and france is getting out there and they're establishing colonies and spain is getting out there and they're establishing colonies and like sweden and everybody is getting out there to try to do something and to try to like become the big thing and like i think it's just kind of funny that it ends up turning around in that america like so many of these countries just are like nope fuck you <laughs> like and then we're now we're our own things like and i feel like that happened that's happened all so much through history like i saw the craziest statistic that was um <laughs> britain is the reason why 90 percent of countries have an independence day and i was just like yep that's uh that tracks like what a crazy fucking stat, man. Like, and I mean, it tracks with how we saw, like, in this time period, how countries are moving to these places and they are establishing colonies and they're making, like, 
these trading ports. And that's why we're seeing all these foreign affair policies happening. We're seeing the conversation of like trying to maintain these pieces so that way they can continue to do all the other things that they want to do. Because, I mean, right now there are a lot of things going on in each of these countries that they're all trying to do. And I would say that peace is easily the best option for all of the countries, you know. At that time, yeah, um, for the reasons outlined. Um, but then 1734, after the elections that were held in that year, um, Walpole's support starts to wane a little bit. So he's, he still has a majority, but not quite as much. Yeah, there was a little group of, uh, I think it was either, it, mm, I think it was Tories um, that like joined together and they were opposing him and they didn't really get that much success. Oh, wait, no, I think it was Whigs because I think that they tried to start their own little party, but it didn't work out very well. Um, but their most successful thing was a press release called The the Craftsman, um, which was like a, a periodical. Week. Yeah, yeah, it was just like yeah. a every week they were just dissing on Warpole. Like and so from that point forward, Warpole is becoming like he's kind of being a, he's becoming a laughing stock of sorts. Like he's being put in ballots, he's being put in plays, he's being put in like uh, pamphlets, newspapers as like these little tidbits of just like fuck this guy kind of thing. And like he, his public viewpoint is definitely going downhill at this point. Like like you said, after this election, we're going to start like. His decline is happening. I mean, we've been saying his decline for a bit, but just not his office decline. He's never really had to worry about his position up until this point. Like now he's actually starting to get a little bit worrisome where he's at. Like his public support has gone downhill quite substantially. So I love that little bit with the craftsman coming in there. Like I thought that that was such a fun little like, I mean, it feels like that's kind of where we see a lot of the the. Like you said, the attacking of the other party because they're the other party, you know, like and we're seeing it in the paper in the papers. We're seeing it in the news or the newspapers. We're seeing it in plays, ballads, all those places. And it's just like, yeah, fuck you. Everybody else is starting to notice the things that you've done. We don't like you. And this is where also we start to see the the impact of uh, the news, the media. Yeah. Um, and how quickly um, it can generate support for people who perhaps don't really have an idea about what's going on. Yeah. But they read this periodical and they see that this periodical is produced by, uh, as I sort of suggested earlier, Alexander Pope, Dr. Samuel Johnson um, were within the group. The periodical, though, is run by Bolingbroke, who is a long standing uh, enemy of uh, Walpole, and then yeah. also Paltony. And you know, these are people who have um, you know, carry a certain political weight um, with them. So, yeah, very much so. It's interesting to be able to sort of point back uh, or look back again you know, at these. These are like more or less the, the first steps towards creating not media empires necessarily, but developing the effect um, of the written word um, in a more modern sort of way yeah. to, to influence the masses in, in a political arena. Yeah, I love seeing that stuff like so far and just like this this little episode, which isn't that little. But in this episode is like seeing where all these connections are coming from and seeing the drawbacks, you know, like it is it is amazing to see where so many of these weird little things have come from of like attacking your opponent in this way. And then also like the media and the way that it really does affect the public viewpoint, like because of all this negative media that he's getting and all this negative attention, he is going like his, his public viewpoint goes downhill from here. And it is a direct correspondence to that, you know, like you can draw that connection immediately and just be like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Like enough people say enough things about you. It makes sense that, yeah, there's going to be a negative viewpoint about you that's growing. Like, and I'm sure that there, he still has supporters because, like, that's always how it goes. Because, I mean, like, I'm thinking with Donald Trump, he's got he's got the most 
like insanely love followers but he also has like the most stern haters you know so like there's always these two sides um and i feel like because he's established himself so well i feel like his most trusted people and the people that like support him the most are are the royalty you know like at this point he's he they're very trusted to him he's been around for so long that they're very much like yeah we trust you we, we think you're pretty decent and so like after he's done he's going to be set up and he's going to be well well off you know like it's i love seeing those connections like i said mm. and i mean i think before then there were lots of other sort of you know pamphlets uh, information sheets essays and so on which were perhaps more of a scientific nature or sort of yeah. academic nature um but but i really think this is what if not not necessarily the first, but one of the first, which really sort of brings about this, uh, the, the, the political element within uh, the, the media. But we can certainly say that it's the first that we've seen for what we're talking about. Yeah, def definitely. Um, so, yeah. And then so what you're talking about there also. The power that he has is dwindling, um, even though he still remains quite influential because of his connection to, as you said, the, the monarchy. But mm. in 1737, Queen Caroline dies. Yeah. Um, and so even though um, he still has a close relationship with George II, um, I think he misses that particular, um, the influence that having... Yeah. Her had because she, she's a good friend as well. She's not just simply somebody who you know he can speak to 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 bend the ear of the he, king. She's also become a friend to him yeah. at this point. Yeah, like, um, and and at that same time, doesn't his wife die? Like he's during this time, if I'm not mistaken, like so they're going through a divide um, in the Whig party. And the group of young Whigs nicknamed the Patriot Boys. That's later on. Oh, so yeah. So during this time, he's also dealing with private affairs. Um, in 1737, his wife passed away, um, of whom he had been indifferent to. <laughs> um, no and surprises then he, there. Yeah. After after learning about this guy, not shocked at all. Um, and then he immediately married his mistress the following year, but then she died three months later, give, giving childbirth. So like, this is this is a tough time for this guy. He's kind of going through it. Although when I read that his uh, mistress died during childbirth, I uh, felt really bad for the woman. I also was kind of like, well, yeah, fuck you, Warpole. Like. I feel like that's kind of what happens when you're immediately like, yeah, no, come, my mistress. <laughs> I'm ready to be married again. Like, I was just like, God, you're such a fucking creepy dude. I don't like that shit, man. But, yeah, like, his, his, in, like, during this time, that's, during 1737 is when that, that young group of, um, like, wigs are coming together, and they're called the Young Patriot Boys. Um, and they are, at this point and up into Warpole stepping down are probably one of his biggest opponents and the people who are able to do the most against him. Um, at least I would say up into like the time when he resigns. Which is not too far away uh, yeah. at, at this point. So Yeah, so mostly the the bit that I have about the Patriot Boys is that one of their biggest standing points um against warpole was that they began using the growing tensions in the west indies um and the trading with spain uh against warpole because of his foreign affairs like he's really trying not to go into war and the patriot boys are really like at this point in time they really believe that he is weak he's not able to stand for a war in the way that they want because at this point there is growing desire for this war to happen which is something that warpole is extremely against and he has been against like he's never been pro-war and he never really like even to the point where he gets forced into this war by that group by the patriot boys he is like 
super against it the entire time. He's not for it. He feels extremely against it. Like he's just – this is not what he wanted. He was forced into this, and if you're forced into something, you're not going to want to do it, you know? And so like the Patriot boys are very much pushing him in these directions that he doesn't want to be in, but it's because they feel – like he's too old to do these things. He's been in power for so long, and he's just not go- like he's not able to represent them the way that they want. And so they're pushing him in uncomfortable ways, and he's just not able to argue for the points the way that he once was, and able to make those convincing arguments to stay in those like to keep those groups in his on his side. He's been like he's losing that power. He's losing that. That ability to just make those like snap decisions of just like, all right, we're doing this. He's now like now other people are being like, no, we're doing this and they're forcing him into it. And so this is really his decline. Like we said, like he's he's hitting the bottom right now, you know. And just to point out, then the among the Patriot boys are George Grenville and a name which we're going to come back to later on because it's particularly prominent is William Pitt on this occasion, the elder yeah. as opposed to the other, um, the younger. So, um, all right. Then we've also got to say that he's against war and has always been against war because it was for his benefit. We're not yeah. talking about somebody who loved human life. Um, at least none that was not his own. Um, and so this is the, the selfish agenda which he was essentially pursuing. Yeah, and um, all under like the guise of that this is in the best interest of of uh, Britain. You know, like it. a lot of what I see is that these people are using it as like, like they use the the idea of British interest, they're using that as like kind of a cover for what they're doing. Um, and that's making those personal profits. It's making those personal gains like they have been doing and like they're like they continue to do. Um, yeah, it's they're all just kind of chilling and they're like, yeah, no, we don't want war because it's not profitable to us. Not because of you guys. We don't really care what you guys think about it. The people who are actually going to fight in this war. It's just because it's not going to be profitable to us. Like, what a painful thing, man. What a painful thing. Yeah, and his um, his problems with the Prince of Wales continue, um, and to such an extent that basically the the prince is uh, numbered among his hardcore opponents, um, along with uh, because he was also the Duke of Cornwall, the the prince at the time, but also um, the Duke of Argyll. Um, And so therefore there are problems developing for Walpole uh, as far afield as Scotland. And then when the new parliament does come in, um, there is no, he doesn't know really where he stands. And so this is where in 1742, and I'm looking at this, the House of Commons, um, where they are looking to determine the validity of uh, what they called the rigged election of Chippenham. Um, Walpole agrees to treat the issue as a motion of no confidence. Um, and this is where he's defeated and he agrees to resign from the government, basically. And that uh, event occurred on February the 6th, 1742. Five days later, he formally relinquished the seals of office. Yes. My God. <laughs> Five days later, five days later, yeah. I had to hold on to it. As long Wowza. as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, this is 21 years. We have cut out an extra, <laughs> a lot. We've cut, we've had to cut out a lot because yeah. we also, we didn't want to just list events and, you know, different shit that he did. We also wanted to analyze it and bring in sort of relevant issues with today and some of the developmental elements um, of, of what they represented. But there is so much about, you know, that we could talk about with regards to Walpole, which we've not oh, done. Yeah. So it is crazy. Yeah, I feel like it was just kind of like skimming the top of the barrel with him. Because like even the the websites that I got into about him, like it just felt like I still wasn't getting all the information that I wanted. Like and he is such an in-depth 
person that there's and there's so much going on with him and the events that he's interacting with and the events that he's taking part in like there's so much to this dude that i was just like fuck you are not kidding about like get ready for a a man of corruption a man of like just deep-seated corruption you know like and i mean i have to add that after he was after he resigned from office that because he was the orford like he was made the earl of orford um the king gave him a pension of four thousand pounds um which is about two hundred thousand dollars roughly um that's a lot of fucking money uh that was a pension every year um that's a lot of cash homie like that that will let you live comfortably for the rest of your life you know what i mean like when i saw that i was like and even after all that you've done in such a horrible way you're still going to be fine and uh that lines up and i mean it, it it's it's that 10 steps ahead thing of he planned it out with the peerage to like be like no 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 i still need this because he knows that once he's like if anything were to happen to him if anything happens he will always have that thing that he can rely on you know it, he's always ready for it and it, it just goes like he he was ready for it and after he resigns he's still very politically active he like gets a protege who ends up becoming the chief minister his name is henry uh, pelham um and he, he Henry is like a big leader in the Whigs party and he makes him his protege and gets him into these positions like and then he dies in 1745 so like three years after his resignation he passes and like in three years to do what he did is just like damn son like you just weren't done you know like and he it didn't feel like he ever really was done he didn't really stop going you know it seems like he just was like just always on the fucking move you know what a fucking crazy way to live and just quickly to add to the legacy because we've also touched on this with regards to the presidents in the white house um george ii offered uh walpole 10 downing street as a personal gift in 1732 but wow. walpole accepted yeah but walpole accepted it as the official residence of the first lord of the treasury um, and he moved there in 1735. Um, not all prime ministers have lived there since, but obviously, as we know now, it is the official residence of the prime minister. So that that's really also cool. Then. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, we could talk a bit more about this, but um, yeah, I think we've already, you know, we've gone way past the one hour, <laughs> which is not necessarily a deadline, but it's cool. Before with the presidents, we did a kind of rating out of 100. And yeah. um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you again, Aiden. Oh, um, actually, yeah. I wanted to ask you. Me? For, yeah, because because see, I'm doing the presidents. I'm I'm the American <laughs> boy. <laughs> And, oh, you know, it I can't I can't rate them. It's not it doesn't feel fair for me to rate them. It's not okay. it's not where I'm from. So okay. I'd like to ask you to rate Warpole on a list on a scale from one to 100. OK. All right. You see, I, I have to take a lot of things into consideration when doing that. And yeah, um, I mean, he was 21 years. He was the first prime minister. He um, he established quite a few um not quite necessarily precedents but modes of behavior which um i think are scandalous um and i have to also say he- something which heavily influences my opinion is the fact that he was a slaver he made mm-hmm. money off the back of the slave trade um and um yeah a lot of very un seem the unsavory and horrible things happened in his time frame. um yeah i'm really going to um, uh, i'm going to rate him extremely low i think um I, i'm gonna give him the number 13 one damn three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, hell it's yeah gotta be said that's I, what i, I like got, to hear <laughs> <laughs> i've had to go really low on that because i i don't think he deserved any better to be honest um, do you think so do you think we're gonna go on to the negatives on on the prime minister list as well um i think we're going to 
I think we're going to. I mean, we've started really low. I'm pretty sure quite a few are going to go much higher than that. Um, But uh, yeah, I, I... People, I know it's when in politics it's become an established thing. Yeah, you've got to do the bad things because no, do you know what? I, I think we've got to start establishing uh, different principles. We shouldn't Absolutely. simply accept shit because shit happens. I don't like shit happens. I think yep. you know good things have got to happen too, um, and um, we've got to start to really remember that we yeah. can actually make a change. And you know, this is a part of that. I'm fucking here for that, dude. <laughs> Absolutely. Aiden, um, again, I'm pretty sure I'm going to enjoy my uh, editing of, uh, <laughs> of of that. Thank you very much for taking up the um, yeah the challenge of addressing prime ministers. I'll ask you now, though. Next one, should we go back to presidents or should we do another prime minister? It's up to you. Um, let's let's keep doing the alternating because I think that okay. the way that uh, prime ministers and and prime uh, presidents might work out is hopefully it should kind of even out just with like the length of terms. Um, but I'm also just really excited to talk about Thomas Jefferson just because he's such <laughs> I knew like, it. A, I'm like, <laughs> I was thinking about that later on. Like I was like another one that I'm really excited about is Thomas Jefferson. Like I'm just excited to talk about like such a fucking interesting guy who really did so much that, uh, much like the legacy of like John Adams of like, maybe if you didn't do all this other shit, probably your legacy would be fine. But like, holy cow, even then it's still like, Jesus Christ, man. Wow. Thomas Jefferson is a fucking character. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about him too. Okay. All right. Next one. It is uh, Thomas Jefferson. Brilliant. Aiden, thank you very much. It's always entertaining. Um, And yeah, I, I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate coming in here again.